then if there's any group of people in the world that ought to be skeptical of democracy, it ought to be Christians. Remember that Jesus Christ was put to death by democracy. The crowd came together. Pilate asked, which one of these men do you want me to kill? The overwhelming majority said, give us Barabbas. We want you to kill Jesus. Hey there, fellow tacticians. Don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that little notification bell because the more likes and subscriptions I get, the more people see my conservative content, which will make America a better place and angers the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. That was stupid. I know it was stupid. Really stupid. Hey, I just said it was stupid. <laughs> and for today's Daily Dose of Stupid, I'm going to do something a little bit different today since it is Constitution Day. I figured we'd go over a specific provision of the Constitution that unfortunately has been under attack quite a bit lately, and this is to be expected. It comes up pretty much every election year, and it's going to be even more of a pain this year because the Democrats are butt hurt that they lost the last election and that they lost the last election despite Hillary Clinton winning the popular vote. And so because of this, the uh, it really comes as no surprise to anybody, but they have started to attack the Electoral College. And so I thought what would be fun to do today is if we went ahead and went over the top five stupidest arguments, since this is the Daily Dose of Stupid, the top five stupidest arguments against the Electoral College and them wanting to abolish it. So let's go ahead and go over that right now. Number five. Number five. One of my favorite ones and the one that probably makes me laugh the most, it's antiquated. I hear this all the time. Well, I just, I don't like this antiquated system of the Electoral College. And they, it's so funny because they talk about the popular vote as though it's a new idea and the Electoral College is antiquated. So here's the thing. A popular vote is essentially something that would be a vestige of a direct democracy. Now, it's obviously not an exact direct democracy because you are, an elect, you are electing an official, a president, but there have been elected officials for a very, very long time now. Democratic popular vote to elect a official to represent the people, that goes back to about 500 BC. So we're talking about ancient Greece, Athens. There were officers that were democratically elected by the citizens of Athens. And that goes back 2,500 years. So the Electoral College is, as of today, 233 years old, yet somehow that's the antiquated idea and their solution to resolving that, just going to a popular vote, that's the new and progressive idea. Uh, yeah, your idea is 2,500 years old. It's such a funny thing that progressives do because they are progressives and that's how they think of themselves. And so because of that, they have to constantly convince themselves that all of their ideas are new and revolutionary and different. But normally, their ideas are old, tired things that have been tried a hundred times and failed a hundred times. Normally, that is the case. When you're talking about the idea just on the broadest scale of government taking care of people, that's actually one of the oldest ideas in government, that the government has the responsibility to care for the needs of the people as some kind of elitist living in an ivory tower and sending down food and, and supplies and everything else to the people. Liberty is a new idea. The idea that man can rule himself and provide for himself and doesn't need a king or a dictator or anything else to tell him what to do, that's a new idea. And the Electoral College is a part of that. It's one of the newer ideas. So the idea that the Electoral College is antiquated and we need to move to this really progressive new idea of a popular vote for president. Dude, <laughs> your idea is like eight times as old <laughs> as the Electoral College. So that one always really made me chuckle. Uh, when they're trying to make that case. Let's go to number four. Number four. Number four, and this one's really funny too. Uh, it always makes me laugh because it's not that they're wrong. It's actually a correct argument. It's just the argument that they're making is a is is not a good one. Uh, so they'll say, when I ask, why, why do you want to get rid of the Electoral College? Well, it's not democratic. Yeah, it's not democratic was never intended to be democratic. 
That's a good thing. That is a point in its favor that is not democratic. And this kind of ties into the last one that we were talking about. Democracies always commit suicide. That is something that the founders stated over and over again. They specifically didn't want America to be a democracy because democracy is mob rule. And in a democracy, the whims of the majority overrule the rights of the individual. If everybody just decides that, oh, well, there's a minority there, we should just take his stuff or kill his family or whatever, they can do whatever they want if the individual does not have rights. The old saying is that democracy is two sheeps and a wolf voting on what's for dinner. Well, that's accurate. Because just because something is de democratically done does not make it a good idea. You know who was democratically elected? Saddam Hussein. You know who else was democratically elected? Adolf Hitler. And Vladimir Lenin and some of the worst people in the history of the world were won democratic elections fair and square. Just because the mob decides to do it doesn't make it a good idea. And so, yes, the Electoral College is not democratic. It was never intended to be. If you want further commentary on why democracy is bad and dangerous, you need look no further than James Madison in Federalist 10. He was articulating the stance of the Federalist at the time, and even the Anti-Federalist didn't agree with this. The Federalist and the Anti-Federalist disagreed on a lot. We just started talking about how the, the Constitution Day that we are celebrating today was the culmination of months and months of arguing back and forth passionately between ideas about government. You know what was never argued about? Democracy. They all knew that democracy was a bad idea. They all knew that that was not going to end anywhere good. There may have been some early debates about it, but they knew because they understood human nature and they understood history, especially coming from Greece, that when you put democracy in place, it doesn't survive long because it always commits suicide. It always runs roughshod over the needs of the minority. Socrates was murdered unjustly because of democracy. And if there's any group of people in the world that ought to be skeptical of democracy, it ought to be Christians. Remember that Jesus Christ was put to death by democracy. The crowd came together. Pilate asked, which one of these men do you want me to kill? The overwhelming majority said, give us Barabbas. We want you to kill Jesus. If there is any group of people in human history that ought to be skeptical of that, it should be Greeks, the Greeks because of Socrates, but even more so Christians because of what happened to Jesus Christ. And remember that when it comes to America, nobody referred to us as a democracy until FDR. All of our presidents, all of our elected officials, even people in the Democrat Party never referred to America as a democracy because they knew that it wasn't until FDR tried to make it into one. And so the idea that it's not democratic being a point against it, no, actually the fact that it's not democratic is a point in its favor. Let's go to number three. Number three. Number three is a funny one too. People in red states and blue states aren't heard. And so the, the thrust of this argument is if you're in an uber red state like Alabama or you're in an uber blue state like New York or California, then all of the people that vote opposite the way that your state does, your voice isn't heard. This is absurd. That's like saying that if you vote and whoever you voted for didn't get elected, then your voice wasn't heard. Well, no, my voice was heard. I just lost. And by the way, this is not a concept I am unfamiliar with. I have for a long time said, if you want to kill somebody's political career, have me endorse them. <laughs> Usually the person I vote for doesn't win. It's very, very rare for me to get the candidate that I want to actually win. That might surprise some people in California and New York and some of the other big blue states. But yeah, I live in a red state. And you know what usually happens? I wind up not winning. Now, I vote for a lot of Republicans. I don't vote for every Republican. I vote for a lot of Republicans. And in the general, you know, a decent amount of the time, the candidate that I voted for in the general comes out on top. But I lose almost every single primary because the most conservative candidate usually does not win. Does that mean that my vote didn't count or my voice wasn't heard? No. It means I lost. And it sucks that I lost, but I lost. That's the way that elections are supposed to work. And if I were living in a blue state, which I probably wouldn't do, but if I were living in a blue state, then my vote would probably make just as much difference there. I'm living in a very red state. If I all of a sudden decided to vote for a Democrat, 
that wouldn't mean my voice wasn't heard. I mean, my vote still counts. It just happens that I didn't win. And so this is a dumb, illogical argument. Uh, but there's another thing that you completely ignore when you make this argument. Nebraska and Maine do proportional voting. The states are at liberty to decide where their votes go. Nebraska can decide, you know, if a certain amount of our population decides to vote one way, we're going to give them an elector. Maine has the same thing. And by the way, if something like that were proposed in Alabama, you know what? I would be in favor of it. Even if it means one of Alabama's electoral votes goes to a Democrat, which it probably would. There's a reason we have Terry Sewell as a representative in the House of Representatives for the state of Alabama. There would probably be at least one Democratic vote from Alabama. But I'm okay with that because I actually really like proportional voting. But the thing is, that happens despite the fact that the Electoral College is still the law of the land, which means that we could do it without the Electoral College. So you saying that, you know, having a, a state where 51% vote one way, that means the other 49% isn't heard. First of all, that's ridiculous. But second of all, you still have the option of changing your state's policy. That's not the fault of the Electoral College. That's the fault of your state, if you believe that. But what's funny is most of the people that do try to make that case that live out in, you know, for example, California, New York. By the way, there's a lot of very conservative areas in California, New York. It just doesn't get talked about because people don't think about upstate New York or northern and rural parts of California. And you'll notice that those people never say, no, we'll go ahead and do proportional voting in California so that, you know, maybe 10 electoral votes actually wind up going to Republicans. They'll never suggest that. They'll say, oh, it's, it's so bad that these people's voices aren't heard, and, and it means that people in red states and blue states, their voices are not heard correctly. And I'll say, okay, well, make California proportional. No, no, no we don't want to do that. We, we don't want those votes to go to some Republican. They don't believe what they really believe. They're just making it because it sounds catchy and they, they think that it's going to be something that helps them in their favor. And here's another thing that they're completely ignoring too. You can always move. That's something that you can do in this country. You don't have to get a passport or anything. You don't have to relocate in that sense. You can just pick up and move to a state that agrees with you more. Ben Shapiro. We found this out, what, a day ago, I think? Ben Shapiro, I, I want to say it was on, yeah, on yesterday, yeah. So yesterday on Ben Shapiro's show... He came out and said, big news, guys, I'm moving to Nashville. Ben Shapiro has lived in California his entire life, and he's saying, you know what? The state has run so terribly, it's so horrible, and I hate living here. I'm just going to move to Nashville. That's also an option. They act like it's not. And frankly, I wish that some of the liberals really didn't believe in that because there's a whole lot of liberals moving out of California and into Texas because of how horribly their state is run right now. But moving is also an option. You can, you can choose to try to change the political uh, di direction of where you are now, or you can choose to move somewhere else. Those are options that are afforded to you, and so they act as though they're completely helpless and can't do anything about it. And, oh, my voice isn't being heard because I'm in a state that disagrees with me. Okay, move to another state if it bothers you that much. I don't understand why this is something that is so difficult for them to grasp. Let's go to number two. Number two. Now, number two on this list, uh, the same states decide the election. Well, the reason that this one's so dumb is because it's just blatantly untrue. The only way that somebody could buy into this narrative is if they have spent zero time actually studying elections of the past. And to prove my point on this, let's go ahead and look at this map. This is from the most recent presidential election, Trump versus Clinton. And so you can see there that, you know, that some states went red, some states went blue. Obviously, several more went for Trump than Hillary, and that's why he is in the White House and she's not. Now, let's do a side-by-side -side comparison with that one and the one from Obama-Romney. So just four years before that. You notice anything different in these two? Trump-Clinton, Obama-Romney, 2012. Yeah, there's a little bit more blue up there than there is in the next election. And why is that? Look at the difference. If you're looking at the most recent electoral map, you'll notice that Michigan and Wisconsin are red. So there are several states that changed over, obviously. Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio. Those are typically thought of as swing states. 
And so, yeah, usually Ohio and Pennsylvania and Florida are very, very important in presidential elections because they are true swing states. However, one thing that people neglect when looking at this is that you've got the two Rust Belt states that switched over. Nobody thought that Michigan and Wisconsin were up for grabs. Nobody did. I didn't. I predicted that Donald Trump was going to lose this election, and in every single uh, test that I looked at, every single prediction that I made, I had Hillary Clinton winning Michigan and Wisconsin. I mean, for Pete's sake, uh, Wisconsin is the cradle of progressivism. And yet, it wound up going for President Trump. Swing states change over time. And the idea that the same states decide the presidential election every time is just ridiculous. There are some states that have been swing states for longer than others, but every state has the potential to be a swing state. Right now, they are talking about Texas going blue. And by the way, that's not just hearsay. It is on the cusp of going blue or at the very least being purple. Georgia has become much more liberal than it used to be. North Carolina might tip in the favor of being blue. Virginia at one time was a Republican stronghold. Now, because of the county surrounding D.C., it's virtually impossible to win as a Republican in the state of Virginia, at least if you're in that near, the, near to the D.C. area, it is now considered a blue state with a Democrat governor. All of that is true in the state of Virginia. And by the way, to further illustrate that point, let's go ahead and look at this uh, map from the Bush versus Kerry 2004 election. So you can see this one here. This is the 2004 electoral map. You notice anything different about this one? Well, what about Colorado and New Mexico? Those are red. They went for Bush. But that's, they're blue states now, right? Well, no, they're not. They became swing states after a while, after you saw more liberal people moving to places like Boulder and even Colorado Springs, which was typically thought of as being a Republican stronghold. Nevada went red, even though it went blue in the last election and went for Hillary Clinton. You notice all of these differences is that there are shifts that happen in regards to the way and the direction that states vote. And so the idea that all the same states are always picking who wins the election is simply untrue. But to beat this dead horse even more, let's go to this map from 1976, Carter versus Ford. So you can see here in this map, this one looks radically different than the other maps that we've looked at. I mean, look at that. The South is solid, solid blue. Texas, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Arkansas, Florida, all going strong and hard for the Democrat Party. And which ones are the Republican states? California, Oregon, and Washington. And by the way, even New England, once you get past New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine, and Massachusetts and New Jersey going for Republicans? This is the, the way that it was in 1976. And 1976 isn't real recent. But keep in mind, it's only 44 years in the past. This isn't ancient history. This is how quickly the states change. Swing states are changing all the time. In the span of 44 years, so, you know, younger, less time than my mom and dad have been alive. We went from California being ruby red to bright, bright blue, and the South being reliably Democrat territory to reliably Republican territory. And so this idea that, oh, well, it's the same states deciding elections all the time, that's a load of crap. There's no gentler way to put it. That's what it is. As recently as just less than 50 years ago, the states basically were the inverse of what they are now, just goes to prove that if any party, Republican or Democrat, neglects the needs of a state for long enough, they're going to see that, sway, that state switch sides when it comes to elections. Now, this is my favorite one. Let's go to number one. And number one. So, number one, by far, without a question, the dumbest argument against the Electoral College I have ever heard, and by far the laziest, it's racist. This is the one of a, a very, very recent one, because there's always been some people that don't like the Electoral College and wanted to get rid of it. Obviously, that's amped up in recent years because of the, high, the, the spotlight that's been put on it because of Gore Bush and then Clinton Trump. But 
One of the most ridiculous arguments that I've ever seen made against it is this one, that somehow it's racist. So let's go ahead and look at this. Um, th th basically, I'll just go ahead and give you the argument first. The argument is, is that it's a holdover from slave owners and slave, uh, slave states to try to make sure that slave-bearing states were the ones that were in control of who is the presidency because those were going to be more rural areas and they were going to be the ones that controlled who was president. Therefore, that was a way to make sure that slavery stayed intact. Well, first of all, if that was the, if that was the plan, they did a really, really terrible job of it because slavery has been done away with for a really long time now. Obviously, their plan to use the Electoral College to make sure slavery continued in perpetuity didn't work. The second part of that is, who is the person that freed the slaves? Well, the president that did that would be Abraham Lincoln. How was Abraham Lincoln elected? By popular vote? No, he did not win the popular vote. You know what he did? He won the Electoral College. That's how Abraham Lincoln, the great emancipator, won despite not winning 51% of the vote. It was split three ways, and Abraham Lincoln wound up winning in the Electoral College. That is how President Abraham Lincoln, the president that oversaw the abolishment of slavery, was put into office. The Electoral College helped in slavery, not the opposite. And by the way, if you want further proof of this, you have to understand where the Electoral College originally came from. Because let's say, okay, well, yeah, that was a weird side effect that just happened to take place with the abolishment of slavery, but the founders, they were all a bunch of evil racist white guys that owned slaves, right? And so they were putting the Electoral College as an attempt to preserve slavery. Yeah, but that's not true either. You see, in the Constitutional Convention, there were two big divisions. One of them was slave states versus free states. This is absolutely true, and this is in accordance with history. So in history, you have those two divisions, and there were two states that wanted to preserve slavery. South Carolina and Georgia. That's it. All the other states, including Virginia, including North Carolina, all wanted to get rid of slavery right then and there. But because they had already agreed that all 13 states had to ratify the Constitution, they made a compromise. And because of that, they allowed slavery to continue as an institution in the four southern states and then phase it out over the period of time where they got rid of the slave trade and then eventually they were going to get rid of slavery as well. Obviously, it didn't wind up working out that way, but that was the original plan. Only two states did not want, uh, did not want to abolish slavery right then and there at the Constitutional Convention. But there was another division that people don't talk about. That other division is the division between large states and small states. This was actually the much larger division that caused, actually, to be quite frank, far more problems than the original. You'll see here, these are electoral college votes in 1789. So this would have been the time, of course, where the Constitution is being debated and ratified. This is the first electoral college vote. So let's look at who has the most electoral college votes. Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Massachusetts with 10. South Carolina and Connecticut tied at second for, with seven. New Jersey and Maryland tied for third at six. Fourth, Georgia and New Hampshire with five votes apiece. And then finally, at three, you have Delaware. Now, if you're breaking all this up, you may be looking at this going, wait a second, Caleb, that's only 10 states. You're missing three. Well, not in the 1789 Electoral College. And the reason for that is... New York had an internal dispute, and because of that, had not gone ahead and, and sent electors for the first electoral college, and so New York is out. And then there were also two states that had yet to ratify the Constitution, and that would be North Carolina and Rhode Island. And so because of that, they were not included in the 1789 presidential election either. So these are all 10 states that actually uh, participated in this. And now I'm going to show you this. Uh, if you look at this again, these are all the slave-holding states. So you'll notice there's a pretty healthy mix here that you've got one of the slave-holding states with the most electoral college votes, and you've also got another one with the least electoral college votes, and then you have one in the middle with, with South Carolina at second. And so if you're trying to make the case that the electoral college was something that was done to preserve slavery, 
then why is it that when you're looking at electoral college votes, that the slave states are all over the map on how much power and representation they had in the electoral college? Frankly, that argument simply does not make any sense. If that was the case, then you would have, you would have them all on the lower end. See, now Georgia, it kind of makes sense to make that argument because Georgia got more representation because they were on the lower end of the electoral college. They didn't have as many people, which would mean theoretically, if this were the case, that all of the slaveholding states would have the least electoral college votes, but that's not what happened. In fact, Virginia and South Carolina were in the top two. Uh, one's tied for first, one's tied for second when it came to electoral college votes. And so if the electoral college was a thing to preserve slavery, well, to be honest, that really doesn't make any sense here. The two factions that were broken up, they were broken up into two groups. There was one supporting what was called the Virginia Plan and one supporting what was called the New Jersey Plan. So the Virginia Plan was the one that was typically favored by the larger states. The New Jersey Plan was one that favored representation by the smaller states and representation by the states themselves. In other words, the ones that would have supported something like the Electoral College as opposed to a straight popular vote where population would wind up winning out regardless. And so let's look at the states that supported the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. So obviously the Virginia plan is supported by Virginia. And then also Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. The ones that were in favor of the New Jersey plan New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Delaware. This is the one that favored the smaller states, at least in general. So let's go ahead and look at that same list, but this time with all of the slave states highlighted in red. Huh. So all of the slave-bearing states were in favor of the plan that favored the states with the highest population, not the ones that emphasized individual states' rights. And over on the one that supported states' rights, in other words, something more akin to the Electoral College, that was New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, and Delaware, all of which had pretty much phased out slavery by this point. So again, the argument doesn't make sense. If the Electoral College and the representation of individual states as entities as opposed to just populations, if that were the case, they would have all supported the New York plan, not the Virginia plan. In fact, a slave-bearing state of Virginia is the one that came up with the plan that would have representation by population. And so the idea that this is, uh, the Electoral College is a vestige of trying to perfect, uh, or sorry, to, to preserve slavery as an institution is simply laughable. There's no truth to it whatsoever. In fact, the exact opposite is true. The Electoral College actually helped end the institution of slavery. So we've gone over the dumbest arguments trying to get rid of the Electoral College, but what we haven't talked about yet, and I think is important to emphasize, is the reason to keep it. Because ultimately what it does is it forces presidents to run a truly national election. They cannot get elected otherwise. They have to campaign in all 50 states, at least to some degree. Maybe they don't make an appearance in all 50 states, but they have to have some kind of infrastructure on the ground. They have to have representation even President Trump, who was pretty much guaranteed to win the state of Alabama and did by a very wide, wide margin, he still had field offices here in Alabama. He still made visits to Huntsville and Mobile and Birmingham. And briefly, I think his bus stopped in Montgomery. I'm not sure that he ever did. But anyway, you know, understanding all of that, even somebody that had it in the bag, as it were, still had to come and campaign to all 50 states. This would not be necessary if the Electoral College were done away with. In fact, it would actually be very easy for you to just campaign in all the major population centers. So you'd have to campaign in New York, and by that I mean New York City, and you'd have to campaign in Los Angeles and maybe San Francisco, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston, all of our big cities. You could pretty much ignore the entire middle of the country and there'd be no reason to actually campaign in a more rural state that doesn't have a very big population. Even some of the New, New England states would get neglected if that were the case. But the founders wanted not just the people, but locations to be represented. They wanted there to be a representation not just of the however, however many people are there, they get the most representation. That's part of it. But they also wanted the lifestyles and the differences to be represented because at the time, we were largely a nation of farmers. 
America was seen as a backwoods rural country, and back then it was. We were frontiers and farmers and ranchers. And so because of that, they wanted that to be preserved later on. They wanted us to not be beholden to the whims of people living in cities that don't understand our local needs and local interests. And so because of that, they put this in place to where the president has to be everybody's president, not just the president of the cities or some major population areas. And so that was something that they put in there to guard that. If you want an example of why that's important, you really don't need to look any further than the EPA. I mean, the EPA is an unmitigated disaster that constantly thinks that bureaucrats in Washington know better than the people that actually have to live on the land and have some kind of vested interest in it. And because of that, a bunch of unelected bureaucrats make decisions for people that have been living on this land for several generations, thinking that somehow they care more about the benefit and the, the welfare of that land than the people that actually live on it and make their living off of it. The founders didn't want that. And that's why they put things like the Electoral College in place, is so those localities could have their voices heard and their interests represented as well. This way, the cities couldn't be ruling over and lording authority over and becoming tyrannical over the rural locations. So let's go ahead and look at this tweet, because I, I think it, this was just hilarious. This is actually an old tweet, but it's one that was put out by AOC uh, a while back. So this was Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. And you'll see that the tweet she's responding to is, it says Queens has more people than 16 states, FYI. And her response is, uh, yeah, like, uh, yet one more reason to abolish the Electoral College. So that was AOC's take on that. But the truth is, it's the exact opposite. Do you really want a single neighborhood in one city, all who live pretty much the same life? I'm not saying they're a monolith or that they're all homogenous or they don't have their own interests. But let's be honest, the needs and the wants and the political ideas of somebody that lives in a tightly clustered community like Queens, New York, that person's going to have very different interests than somebody that's living out in Nowheresville, Kansas, or slap out Alabama. They're going to have completely different worldviews, completely different lifestyles. And so do you really want all that power concentrated in one neighborhood, in one city, in one state? that they would get the bulk of representation for the entire country and be making rules for them. This is part of the reason that AOC, specifically other Democrats are like this too, but it said things like, yeah, we just need to like get rid of all private cars and stuff and just like all ride on trains. Well, that probably works fine for somebody that has lived in New York their whole life. That probably wouldn't be something that is terribly inconvenient for that person. But if you live in Alabama... It would be ridiculously expensive and not at all efficient to try to do that. Our entire infrastructure is structured around big open spaces where you might have to drive 30 minutes to get to your nearest grocery store. That's just not practical if you don't live in a major metropolitan area like AOC has her entire life. And that's why her policies and her ideas and her lifestyle does not need to dictate to the rest of Alabama or other rural locations the way that they need to live their lives because they don't understand the differences. And by the way, I don't understand what it's like to live in New York, which is why I don't want to tell them how to live. I leave that up to them. And that's something the, that the Electoral College preserves and protects. And just as a, a final parting shot here, this is an electoral college map of the Obama versus Romney election broken up by district. Remember, President Obama won this election. And if you break it up by county, this is what that electoral map looks like. Awful lot of red there, isn't it? And you'll notice that even where there's not red, even where it's blue, it's light blue. This is proportional. So the darker blue it is, the more one-sided it was for Democrats. You see how much red there is? That's how much of the country would be completely ignored if the Electoral College were to ever go away. And remember that even in the blue parts, the ones that are light blue, those are the more rural areas. The only ones that are really dark blue are major metropolitan areas because those are the people that tend to vote for Democrats. The big divide between Republican and Democrat, really, it's just almost kind of a shell. In other words, a 
uh, a facade of the real debate that is going on in this country, which is rural versus urban. Obviously, it's not always just that. There are going to be some conservatives in urban environments. There are going to be some liberals in rural environments. That is true. But ultimately, it's important to remember that a vast majority of the country, people living out in the rural areas that are not living in major cities, would be completely ignored and not represented at all if the Electoral College were to ever go away. Like anything else, when, it, when something becomes a democracy, it becomes mob rule, which ignores the rights of the individual. That becomes tyranny of the majority. <laughs> It's not exactly a secret that YouTube really doesn't like conservatives, so I'm asking for your help. I don't want to stick it to them. I just genuinely want to show them that conservative voices do matter and that there is a big, passionate audience out there that wants to hear them. So give us a like and subscribe, remembering to click the notification bell, and show YouTube that you do want more content like this. Sincerely, thank you.